Uh, good to see you all. Um, uh, so welcome to another Genomics Aotearoa uh, seminar. Um, I hope you're all well. Uh, sorry, I went really chatty there. I don't quite know. Yeah, are you good? Are you good? Uh, if you're not good, put something in the chat and we'll hear about it. Um, so um, thanks for tuning in. Um, the, I did want to mention that uh, we also host an Asia Pacific seminar series, uh, which um, uh, was last month, which um, you should have come to because it was awesome. But uh, due to the International Congress of Genetics, we'll be skipping uh, the next one. And then and the next one, I'm hoping, will be in August. And it will be our very own Kim Handley with luck. Uh, so, I mean, it's a long way till August. So something will probably happen. But um, yeah, uh, so if you want to look up those things, actually, the best place to go is the Genetic Society of Australasia website, which will show you, uh, tell you what the seminars were and, and have things. So... Uh, today's seminar, however, um, is one of our very own. So uh, we've got uh, Dr. Shannon Clark from AgriSearch, who has been a longtime supporter of genomics outro. And in fact, I think one of the um, one of the key figures in genomics in New Zealand in general. Um, so she's um, going to be talking on, sorry, I managed to lose the title, Genomic Solutions Underpinning Implementation and Impact, which I think uh, is a salutary, will hopefully be a salutary lesson to all of us that all our research needs to have impact uh, out there with the people we work with. So Shannon, you're good to go. Thanks. All right. Kia ora koutou, ko kai tahau, tahu ta iwi no ataka o a fano mai a tipu ake autopoti ko Shannon taka ekua ko um kira uh, koto. So thanks, Peter, um, and thanks for um, everyone turning up on a Friday afternoon. Um, yep, I'm Shannon Clark. I'm a principal scientist within the animal genomics team um, at AgriSearch based at Invermay, which is just um, uh, out of Moscow and just over the hill from uh, Targa University in Dunedin, for those that don't know. Um, so I've uh, picked a sort of a, a seminar to give, I guess, on genomic solutions, and really it's, it's kind of quite high level of the work that we've been doing. Um, I've been with Ag Research for 16 years, so it really does pick up from the beginning of that when we started um, um, generating our SNP chips, I guess, so moving from sort of microsatellite markers to SNP markers, and just where we've come, I, I guess, um, along that and all the underpinning uh, work that we've been doing in um, collaboration with Genomics Aotearoa. So I've put this in because I get asked quite a bit, even though the word genomics is out there and people say, well, what is it? And it means something to everybody else. But really, at the end of the day, genomics is an interdisciplinary field of biology focusing on the structure, the function, the evolution, mapping and editing of genomes. And so what's a genome? Well, it's an organism's complete set of DNA but it's including all of its genes and it's the hierarchical structure, the three-dimensional structural configuration. But what's really exciting, what's happened over the last sort of decade is even though we've known this, it's, we've actually got the tools and the assays to be able to really look into what this three-dimensional structural configuration actually is and incorporate that, not just single nucleotide um, polymorphisms into our genomic solutions. So what do I actually mean by genomic solutions? Well, these could be the estimation of genetic diversity and differentiation. They could be as simple as parentage assignment and inbreeding estimation, or moving towards genomic selection, or just really looking at genome-wide association studies. So to generate a genomic solution, the sort of four pillars I think you really need to make sure you have to ensure that it's implemented into an industry or a breeding population. You can't get away from phenotyping. So Phenotyping can be quite expensive. You might have to look for proxy phenotypes to be able to deliver something that's more um, economical in a breeding perspective, but you still really have to make sure you have that gold standard understanding of what your trait or phenotype you want to look at. And this has to be paired with some sort of genomic information. So sequencing technologies, as we know, are improving um, every day and um, it's good, but you have to make sure that you are agile in your methods that you're utilizing. So you've got your phenotype data, big data sets, especially if you're moving towards digital phenotyping, a lot of sequence data coming through. You need to make sure that you can actually have compute efficient and cost efficient genomic analyses. And all these three together have to be with some sort of breeding program um, or um, a way of implementing your research. Um, and so, we're really lucky here at the animal genomics team based um, 
at Inverme um, mainly, but also with others um, throughout Ag Research, but also the many collaborators that we have in the genomics field. But here we have a really strong phenotyping um, uh, facilities. We do have our own research flocks. These flocks are really important because they are linked um, and aligned to the industry. We have great facilities to be able to actually look after the, um, the flocks and do the uh, phenotype collection. A lot of this is with our um, farm team, but also a really important as we have a really good field team that actually can do these measurements. We have engineering and um, we have a CT scanner to actually really understand the animal physiology for a number of our traits feed and take facility, and we actually have a methane um, facility here at Infame. We also are lucky to have a iso lab with a very specialized lab team. We have sequencing technologies. We are mainly Illumina based. We have um, an eye scan. We have two eye scans actually, a MySeq and an OverSeq. And we also have been doing a little bit of the um, ONT on minnow ions here, but then of course we will either um, work with Target Genomics or the Brigato to do um, bigger projects um, with ONT. Again, our animal genomics team is very multidisciplinary, but we also have support from statistics and bioinformatics at Ag Research um, and quantitative geneticists. And again, for genomic solutions, we make sure we have collaboration. Collaboration is really important with our industry. They are very progressive um, and also want to um, improve and use of the use of genomics um, and are very supportive. But we also have to make sure we have a commercialization pipeway, pathway of anything that we're actually doing so they can really have that industry uptake and have that impact, not in generations to come, but within the generations that we're actually doing now. So a simple, um, well, maybe not as simple, but a genomics pipeline. And this is, the seven, I guess, pillars that I make sure that we're always um, refining. We don't just establish a system, we actually make sure that we're on top of it. Um, each time things change. So however you're going to get your DNA sample, um, if you want to have this in a commercial line, so this is this across here is what I would call our commercial genotype and pipeline, genomic solution pipeline. How you're going to do that tissue sampling is actually really important. It has to be um, good for and easy and um, for your producer that you're working with. Um, and it has to be a system that is actually has QC built into that um, for data quality. DNA extraction, one thing that we've maintained is a high quality um, DNA extraction method. A lot previously or still do a quick and dirty in for genotyping, DNA samples gone, don't use it again. We do have this high quality system and we do keep this so that for future proofing, and you really need this because the change in sequencing technologies or any genotyping technologies um, is, is, happens quite often. Um, and so we sometimes need to go back and just double check um, things and we have those DNA samples. So we do have a lot of long-term DNA storage, um, both from a research perspective, but you know a lot of this is for the influential animals um, and, and um, plant species um, in New Zealand. Genotyping, this is the bit that sort of we work on the most or I've been working on the most um, and actually making sure that we have systems that are actually you know, in place, um, up to date and we have to be forward thinking. So what we're implementing into the um, industry, we might have started thinking about that 10 years ago and now they're using it. So we have to make sure that we're um, always forward thinking in that space. Data storage, efficient compute, um, whether it's within a research database linked or aligned to industry databases, um, it's really important. Constant um, reanalysis um, of our predictions that we're using there from a research perspective, making sure that we can actually um, have that compute efficient method of analysis and more um, accurate. And of course, at the other end of reporting um, for our industry. But it's this cycle here that is really important, a discovery, validation, and implementation. And we do this in conjunction with our industry, with our breeders, with the information that they are providing from the tools that we develop. And this is all happens with whatever phenotype or trait, um, trait recording that you're actually doing. This might be from our research flocks, um, it could be from the breeding tier or commercial genotyping and phenotyping that's coming in. And it's this component here that we actually make sure that we are always ahead of the game for our industries. So I'm just going to go back to the genotyping because this has been really um, important and what Julie have been working on the last 10 to 15 years. 
So when I joined um, Ag Research in 2006, we were moving away from microsatellite markers and we were in progress of um, starting to develop the first um, sheep snip chip array. It was a 50k uh, marker set back there. We did this in conjunction with International Sheep Genomics Consortium and with Illumina. This chip was um, produced, it was really good, but it was still very expensive for the industry to utilise. The way the industry were utilising it for genomic selection, and just here is a schematic of genomic selection of how it's actually done. You'll have a training population, you'll have genotype and you'll have the phenotype of this, you'll train models for your genomic selection, then you'll have your breeding material, you'll just genotype this, you'll calculate your genomic breeding value and then you'll make selections. When we had the 50k chip, and I'll say the very first ones that were actually produced in 2008, they were $1,000, too expensive um, for an industry to utilise. So the influential, um, the reference population was done here. And then what we did from that is generated lower density. So it's actually this 5k SNP array here um, we developed. And the idea of that was it was a lot cheaper. So at the time it was about $40 or it might have been $50 to do that and so you could genotype at $50 and then you would impute so you'd fill in up to the 50k marker set and then this would be used to gener generate your breeding value. Now there's lots of um, toing and froing in here I guess of all the chips that we've actually developed over the years. After this 5k the next one we actually did was this 600k marker set. This high density array the reason we did this, we wanted to look at genome-wide association studies with this. We also knew that we wanted to be able to, in future, be able to impute from a high-density SNP array up to a whole genome equivalent, so imputation to sequence. Again, we we're using this for our reference population to improve our breeding values, but this has become a very important tool to generation of the new chips. So after this 5K, we actually went into a 15K, and this 15K included a lot of the QTL markers that we found of our 600K markers um, high density chip. There's been iterations of this and the reason for that is we really wanted to get that price point down. Price is really important for industry as you'd imagine and you know when I started with Ag Research $10 test is what the breeders wanted. Um, now we just give them, trying to give them um, more for less. So now actually we've moved for all these iterations we have a 60K chip now, and this 60K chip is um, at a price point that was a lot lower than all the rest, and we can continue to improve this chip with the QTL markers that we actually um, find our single gene traits um, going forward. So just an example of um, this, this work and how it's been um, implemented into industry. And I've chosen um, meat quality as the example here. And this is because the, we had a um, Farm IQ, which was a PGP, a primary growth partnership uh, with MPI um, to actually underwrite um, the development of that HD um, SNP chip. And this is actually what it looks like. So we did that and we did a whole lot of genome-wide associations of different meat quality um, phenotypic measurements. So we looked at tenderness, the marble score, so that's a um, proxy for that intramuscular fat, fat depth, um, eye muscle depth, so yield traits, the carcass length and our meat quality here. And we've been working with um, some breeders for a while here, just showing a genetic trends graph over the years. So you can see um, and, and the red line here we've got is just our, um, is the, um, the national average of the terminal flock. So a terminal flock is one of those produced um, prim primarily for, um, for meat and the meat quality we want to keep an eye on. So the implementation of the genomic selection for this actually happened around 2013. You can see that at, at the time these ones had still been utilising a method of um, progeny testing. So they were measuring um, these meat quality traits but it wasn't coming from a genomic prediction, it was coming from an estimated breeding value based, based on parent average. So with the implementation of this chip, and you can actually see that the um, distance between this um, and the slope of this line is, is higher than just the national average. I just want to point out this little dip here. So um, talking with the breeders when they were doing the selection and they were having this trajectory here, 
what happened was they decided just to lessen the um, selective pressure they were putting on meat quality just to see how much what you know if it would make a difference and you could actually see that dip there so when you took off the pressure of that meat quality um, selection um, pressure there they they sort of lost a bit of gain that they were making with that and so now they've just gained that um, back but I just get the question you know does genomics work does it actually work and so I've um, got three different flocks um, here from the industry and we've got the blue and the orange happen to be terminal sire flocks um, and the gray is a maternal flock. This is just looking at meat quality index. And so um, breeders had been going for real lean, um, going for more meat yield and it was more lean. And there was an idea that it was actually, you know, too much fat was coming off from a meat quality perspective. And you can see from the meat quality index that this was actually happening. But on that introduction of the genomics work that we've been doing, you can see that we've got an upturn here of these terminal sire flocks there. And so the genomics really has um, turned the tide there for meat quality. One thing when we were doing this for meat quality, we wanted to make sure, and when we're introducing any new um, trait for selection, is to make sure we're not upsetting or having a negative impact on any of the other um, traits. And so on this side, we can see that our terminal worth index, so that's what they were doing their um, selection on their um, on production and growth. We wanted to make sure we weren't affecting that by introducing that, and you can see that they've continued um, to increase. Um, and then I just want to highlight another um, phenotype. So meat quality, as you can imagine, is a hard to measure trait, so really good for ge um, genomics. And so is methane emission. It is a hard and expensive um, trait to measure. This is work that is sort of um, led by Suzanne uh, Rowe. Um, and here we have been, um, over the years, using these SNP chips and genomic selection to breed low methane uh, ruminants, in particular sheep. This is actually done by having measurement technologies um, on farm. So we actually have sheep will go into this. This is called a port portable accumulation chamber. Um, this trailer goes around the different breeders across the country. Um, methane emissions um, and that phenotype is actually collected and utilized to produce um, genomic breeding values down here for methane emissions um, that the industry um, are, are using. We're also um, developing molecular phenotypes for this, and I'll come back to this um, in a couple of slides. So that's just a couple of examples of what the SNP chip technology over the last 10 years is really doing by pushing um, the use of genomic selection and really upturning in that um, genetic trends for those hard to measure traits. We've been using and continue to use SNP chips for um, our sheep industry because a lot of the work had already um, been done, we had predefined set of markers, so we wanted to continue to do that. However, we know that there are sequencing based technologies out there, and we've spent a lot of time looking at genotyping um, by sequencing for um, the uh, really implementing this into industries that haven't had to um, make use of the sort of predefined SNP markers, so you want to include them um, going forward. And so the GBS that we've been using is a restriction enzyme based method, basically digest the DNA with a restriction enzyme, barcode that, amplify it and sequence it. And at Ag Research, um, we have been doing this for a lot, over 90 species, um, over, uh, over 700,000 samples with our um, top five samples here, sample numbers that we've been doing. Now, I just wanted to point out that we're actually doing low depth GBS because a lot of people will be doing GBS and they will utilize it by sequencing quite deeply to make sure um, they will filter on maybe 10 reads to support that um, genotype. Whereas we don't do that because we still want this to be a cost effective method um, in, to industry. And see so here I've just got some examples showing a comparison between our low depth GBS and the SNP chips. So over here, we have a relatedness, um, and we can see that the slope is one, the intercept is zero, and we have a correlation of 0.99. Here you can actually see the differences with the minor level frequencies. So when you're de designing a SNP chip, you know, you choose the SNPs that go on there. You make sure you do have a minor level frequency um, across the board there, but you tend to, depending on your chip, have higher minor level frequencies so to ensure um, that it does work across the populations. 
However, in the blue, we've got here some mile hour frequencies that you can get from GBS. So one from that is you actually can get the whole spectral of the minor allele frequency and find those rarer alleles. And here's just a comparison of genomic breeding values um, using GBS and um, chip data that was done using um, spring sheep. So how do we actually do this? So the data structure that we use, because it is low depth. So just in this slide here, it's quite a busy one, but just want to explain. So you've got three individual animals across here, goats in this picture, and we've got three individual um, SNP positions. The green, we, you know, we know what this um, actual genotype might actually be for this particular example. And here we have what we call an allele count. And here we'll have what your traditional method would be. And what I mean by that is when we do sequencing, we'll get a number of reads that might support that particular SNP there. And so for this one here, if I was going to do a, go with a traditional method and I just looked at what the um, alleles that were actually represented from those two reads, I'd be calling this a CC. However, what we do is we do an allele count and we'll say we've seen two reads that support the C, sorry, two reads that support the C and none that support um, the T. So we'll call it a two zero. Um, and there's another one here, we would have had a sequencing um, error here, would have come through because we look at this and we know that it is a, um, a CC uh, and we, so we can account for these um, sequencing um, errors as well. And all of this is work that was um, led by uh, Ken Dodds in the construction of relatedness matrix using genotype sequencing, and it is low depth sequencing. And we call it kinship GBS depth adjustment, KGD. Happens to be Ken's initials too. This gives an unbiased genomic relationship matrix, and it does use the method via um, method one via Van Raden, and it accounts with a sequence read depth at each individual SNP location, including SNPs with zero and or missing reads. So therefore, it actually allows this GBS, as I mentioned, to be applied at read depths, which should be quite low and chosen to op optimize information obtained. For example, you know, two reads per SNP. And we also filter our excess heterozygosity. This could be due to a partial polyploid or other duplications. And we use this in a um, simple graphical method um, and it's called the fin plot, which we see down here. So quite often we will filter out these, these um, high myelial frequency um, regions uh, here. Um, we do this, don't use an amputation, and you can find all the R code to be able to utilize this um, on the GitHub site. And an example of this, um, well, I've chosen the work that we've been doing with the Meredith goats from um, Australia. This is a really exciting example. Uh, Meredith the dairy, they had no pedigrees um, at all. And so we derived uh, GBLAP um, genomic selection uh, um, method for that to provide breeding values. This was done with genotype and base sequencing. Um, using the PST1 um, enzyme and 56,000 SNPs are used for this. And as I said, low depth, 1.9 reads um, is average. And within three months, we managed to go from basically this, we can see their production across here and their genetic trends um, for their cheese index, um, pretty flat over the years, but with the introduction of genomic selection, we can see that the gains that they have actually made. So the selection pressure is on the cheese index. Just wanted to point out there's no selection um, pressure there um, in the index at the moment for somatic cell count. So that's like for mastitis, but it does look good that it is actually starting to drop. Um, and here is just, again, no selection pressure is putting on what's a trait called fresh to dairy weight. So that is when the weight um, of the dough when it first goes into um, milking, there is a slight increase, um, which keeping an eye on, um, but the gains that have been made here um, is far outweighing that by any um, additional weight gain um, from these doughs. So that's um, really um, exciting example there with GBS and the progress that we've made um, with that over the years, but you know, seeing the impact that we're actually having on the industry. And so just some other examples that we're using this low depth GBS for, again, you can use it for genetic diversity. Um, we've been doing um, GWAS studies there, whereby you use a probabilistic um, genotype call. Um, and so you see, get to see the um, 
the full range of the potential um, alleles there. Um, a lot are just um, not necessarily using it for genomic selection yet, but they are utilizing the genomic relationship matrix there to make sure they manage their inbreeding and do their sele selection uh, candidates there for breeding. Also, a lot of work has been done with um, Timothy Belton, where he's also been um, using this GPS data to construct um, linkage uh, maps and help with um, genome assemblies in that way, and also looking at different um, LD structure. And you can find all his code also um, on the GitHub uh, repository there. And so beyond the use of that um, GRM, so the We've been looking at the genomic relationship matrix previously, as I said, with parentage, pedigree, diversity, and genomic selection. But you can do other things with, with um, the GBS data. Here's an example here where we've actually mapped the genotype and sequencing reads to the host, but also to the bacterial genome and recorded these counts. And we're utilizing this to actually um, inform the, um, the um, and utilize that data for uh, disease resistance um, in the Arctic char. And here's an example with uh, working with a doc in the Take Recovery Program, where we will construct a genomic relationship matrix um, and then get the diversity there for that, but also looking at the gender. And this is because when the chicks are very young, they can't um, physically identify if they're actually male or female, and they need to know this, of course, before they decide where they're going to relocate those chicks. And so we've just been mapping the GBS data back to the Z and the W um, regions um, to enable the different counts to establish whether the gender is female um, or male. And again, I'm now just bringing you back to that slide where we've been looking at methane emissions and how we can help the industry to reduce this. Um, and so the method that we have been using um, at the moment as our phenotype is the collection of the methane that we get from this portable accumulation chamber. The one thing that we keep doing is making sure that we can possibly look at other proxy traits um, for methane. And what um, Suzanne and her team have been doing is taking the rumen content from uh, the animal and using our restriction enzyme based sequencing um, method of that rumen microbial um, profile to develop what we're calling a molecular phenotype for this. So we're using those microbes um, and the microbiome community in there to, for the prediction of methane. So as I said, we collect a rumen sample, we sequence this uh, microbial genome using restriction enzyme based, basically our GBS method there. And then we predict the merit using the microbial um, genomics, but also the host genomics as well. So we're using combination there. And we have found that the correlate, genetic correlation for the methane um, with PAC is 0.76. And so just over here onto this graph, we have the genomic accuracy. So that's just from the host genetics using the um, 60K SNP chip data there. The orange is from the microbial community, and then the gray is if we join those two predictions together. Um, these are some standard traits. You wouldn't necessarily expect um, a lot of difference there, um, including the microbiome or not. However, over here, when we're looking at the methane emissions, you can actually see that if you combined the um, genomic and the microbial um, emissions there, you get an increase um, in accuracy. Um, so this is looking um, really favorable going forward. So coming back to this um, genomics pipeline, I hope you've I've just shown you that we've been looking at SNP arrays. Um, we do um, use off the shelf ones, but we tend to actually generate our own custom ones there and we keep updating those. And we've also been using um, DNA sequencing methods um, and I've just really talked about a GBS that we've been um, doing that. And in this pipeline, we do make sure um, and we continue to refine because we do need to have a price um, of uh, output to our industry so we can have that uptake. So this $25 per sample um, for the GBS and, and for the SNP chip, so both those, um, pretty similar price. And that is from receipt of a TSU, the DNA extraction, the genotyping, and then the data goes into um, the evaluation database and reporting. Um, so when we are generating any new genotyping tools for the industry, we have to make sure we're either no more than the $25 mark, or we can actually get less than that. 
So that's, that's what I've say standard genotyping and that's what we've been working on. But now we know, as I said to begin with, there's a lot more um, assays out that we can include better information. So can we actually impute to whole genome sequence and get more causative or more accurate markers to include on our SNP chips? This here is a genome-wide association whereby um, Andrew Hess and um, conjunction with genomics Aotearoa um, utilised and um, imputed all the HD um, genotypes for the traits up to whole genome equivalent. And then the other thing we're looking at here is can we actually look at the structural variation that um, within the genome and include this in our prediction um, accuracies going forward. So can we improve our genomic tools with the um, new, new methods, establish new methods? We'll do this for the, um, as an exemplar within our sheep industry, but these all these improvement of these genomic tools will then be able to be utilised in other primary industries and um, conservation genomics alike. So our sheep industry is quite a diverse um, breed population that we um, have and this is just showing the work that um, Andrew Hess had done whereby he looked at the imputation accuracy um, currently um, in our um, genomic prediction for the different breeds. Each colour here represents a different breed and um, the different size there of the um, circles is just how good um, they were imputed or not. But this piece of work was done so that we could actually lift all our genotyping from our HD chip here, so 600 markers, up to the equivalent of whole genome sequence. And this is an example of that. And then what we have done is we've gone and selected those additional markers um, from the whole genome sequencing, and then we've put them back onto this chip in the middle, which is our 60K chip. It takes 96 samples. So we're continuously updating that chip from the information that we um, obtaining from these um, underpinning um, improvement of our genomic tools. And so Andrew had done um, a lot of area uh, work in this area, a lot of GWAS across here. And um, when we're looking at different um, areas of the genome there of the current genome assemblies, there was lots of regions that weren't, um, they weren't identified with any um, genetics, uh, genetic, uh, any genes or functional annotation, um, but also there was regions that possibly were um, structural variants. So we've actually moved, and this is work that's been carried out by Rebecca Clark, who is a um, postdoc with an ag research, um, and this is work uh, in collaboration with um, Genomics Aotearoa, where she's actually looking at using nanopore in adaptive sequencing. So with adaptive sequencing with nanopore, you'll have your DNA sequence um, molecule will be coming, come through here, um, and the first five, uh, 400 bases will be read. If those 400 bases are in the um, file that you have provided to, um, to the technology that you actually want to capture, then it will continue to read. So it'll accept that sequence. However, if those four, first 400 um, bases aren't in that, then it'll actually be ejected out. So we won't um, include that in our sequencing. So this is this read until adaptive sequencing that Rebecca has been investigating um, a number of these genomic um, uh, GWAS regions. And here's just an example that she um, has shown here. And in this adaptive sampling was looking at structural variant. And this is a known um, structural variant that we had identified and that was worked with um, Catherine McRae, um, whereby there was a long haplotype and a short haplotype. So the HBA locus um, is a long haplotype here. And so therefore you see um, reads that are mapping there from the adaptive sequencing um, and then B as a short haplotype, so there's less reads there. And here we have a heterozygote, um, so you can pick up those regions as, um, within that. So that is looking um, really favorable. But what Rebecca wants to do is move from individual looking at this region um, to multiplexing. So here's just showing the individual adaptive sampling that she's been doing. So this is just an individual sample on a um, minion. Um, uh, nanopore um, flow cell and the red is just the, is the chromosome um, and then the, the blue is, is, the, um, is the targeted region. So you can see that there's been enrichment um, across, the, across each one of these chromosomes that she was um, looking at. And over here, we can see that we've got, she's got 52 regions, regions of interest that she's actually looking at um, simultaneously. And you can see that we've got an, um, 
an increase of uh, 15 times um, fold within that. And each color here just represents a different um, chromosome that these regions have been identified on. So that was looking promising. So now she's moved to multiplexing of three samples. This three samples was done on the gridiron using their target genomics facility. Um, and, um, and Augustine has been um, really good and helpful there with the work with um, Rebecca. And this is just showing that she's um, with the three individuals barcoded multiplex together. We can see that we're getting enrichment um, across the um, across the chromosomes. And again, we're actually getting enrichment on those targeted regions that she's looking at. Now, Rebecca has just been um, up with uh, at Brigato and she has multiplexed um, um, uh, 12 samples now um, and using the Prometheon there and that's looking really good. Um, but I will leave that for Rebecca to be able to update you on a seminar she might give at a later date. So we've been looking at um, using adaptive sequencing there for um, structural variation um, identification. Another um, underpinning resource that we've been working with is actually, you know, moving to um, better genome assemblies. And the way we've been doing this is using um, a trio canoe based method. So it's a method that's been around for quite a while now, I think 2018, whereby we'll use long read sequencing of an F1. This F1 has been um, generated through crossing quite diver diverse genetic breeds. So we have a merino here, and this merino was crossed with an Owasi breed. And the way this works is that we uh, have long read sequencing um, of the F1. We do short read sequencing with the Illumina, and we use that Illumina short read sequence to bin, so to identify out of these reads that we see that are either from um, paternal or from the maternal, so the blue and the red there, to bin um, all the these graphs that we see across here, bin them into a paternal assembly um, or a maternal assembly. So basically from sequencing, long read sequencing of an F1 progeny, we can get the two parental um, breed genome assemblies out. So this again is work that we've been doing in conjunction with Genomics Aotearoa and also internationally funded with um, USDA uh, NEFA as well. So what we've done here is a Merino and an Awasi. We're also um, looking at different breeds of sheep. This is with Focus Genetics, whereby they're looking to bring in um, different breeds with the idea of adaptation and um, a changing um, of climate. So um, we've, we've done that as well. And so at the end of this, hopefully um, within New Zealand, we'll have um, seven genome assemblies to contribute to a larger project of called a pan genome project. This pan genome project and the idea of that is to move away from having a single, for example, the orange here genome assembly and to capture all that structural variation across there and we'll combine um, the pan genomes with the number of full genome assemblies that we have and to capture that into genome graphs. And the data that we're generating out of um, this work through with Genomics Aotearoa and USDA will inform another GA um, uh, project there, which is called the Genome Graphs and using this information. And again, it's to move towards functionally annotating these genomes as well. So in New Zealand, I was meaning, mentioning just before, we've done the Merino and the Awasi, the other ones, breeds that we've been looking at for Focus Genetics is Wiltshire, Romney, Shire, Damara, and Dorpa. This is part of an international collaboration with at least 13 to first breeds, what will become a pan genome. And this information has also been utilized to establish um, best practice and methods with um, establishing genome graphs. Together with some um, MB funding as well from another project I'll talk about just in a minute, is we're really looking at the functional annotation um, of these genomes um, as well. Well, one thing we have done is collected from all of these, a number of tissues and this tissue resource, what we have here at AgResearch, it's not just for the project that um, we might be working on, but we have this resource that other people can also um, make use of um, when it comes to the the chromatin architecture, transcriptome, methylome, and subsets of these tissues. So 
we're working hard on this discovery, validation, implementation um, pipeline to make sure that we can actually incorporate not just SNP genotyping within that, but can we actually, you know, have more um, accurate from doing a whole genome imputation or making sure that we can get some structural variation um, within that as well. Um, but also moving towards that functional annotation. And there is a way that we can capture some of that information into what I would call our genomics pipeline. And it has to be something that could be seamlessly implemented. And what we're looking at is methylation. And the reason we're looking at methylation is because it is quite an easy assayable um, mod um, DNA modification. It can be thought of that sort of fifth base within that. So I lead a um, MB program called Beyond the Genome, and this is about harnessing the methylome to accelerate adaptation to a changing environment. And the basis of this is the hypothesis that the genome-wide DNA methylation, in other words, the methylome of an organism is fundamental to its adaptive ability over short timescales. And this MB program basically is wrapped up in this uh, diagram here whereby we have had engagement with industry partners and stakeholders from the get-go. What we have been doing is making sure that we can establish environmental stress resources and then move towards a methylome phenotype. In doing this, we have that underpinning functional genomics and we align with um, those other programs that I've mentioned, so within the, U the USDA-funded um, international programs as well as with um, Genomics Aotearoa, and we want to refine methylome profiling tools. And with all of this, we're establishing bioinformatics and statistical tools um, that can be hopefully um, transitioned into other primary and conservation um, areas. The main things we want to do in this program is have a really fundamental understanding of the methylation and profiling. And this is not just looking at our livestock, but also you know, what they eat as well. So we have this program where it's looking at ryegrass and clover, as well as um, predominantly sheep and um, cattle. We want to know what the methylation role is in adaptation and whether or not it's truly transgenerational methylation. And all of this together, the um, impact we want to have in our industry is to see if we can have that methylome as a predictor trait. Is it possible that the methylation at an early age can be a predictor of a trait at a later age? So to do this, um, we are looking at combining, as I said, functional annotation methods, underpinning technologies. You know, these are tens of hundreds of individuals. This is done in, um, in alignment and collaboration with other funding um, programs. But within this program, we're really particularly looking in, can we develop a molecular phenotype? We need to have high throughput methods. We need to do this on thousands and it has to be cost effective. We've been looking at reduced complexity methylene profiling, um, well-known ones, RRBS, you can have make a um, SNP chip. We're also wanting to develop new methods. Um, and we've been looking at different uh, methylation sensitive enzyme methods. The whole point of this is to have high throughput and reduce the cost. Just an example here of what we've been looking at. Um, so we've got single nucleotide methods that we can look at. Um, that's methylation, the CPG site. You can use a whole genome by sulfate, um, a reduced representational method. And we've also been looking at an EPGBS method at the moment. However, this here is not as reproducible um, as we'd like. Um, we're still trying to refine this. The reason why we're looking at this, and as you can see, it just there's a little bit of a difference of when you do your multi multiplexing, when you do your conversion, uh, um, it does reduce the cost of this method quite substantially. We'll also be looking at a DREAM assay, so this is based on restriction enzyme site again, whereby you have consecutive um, digest with SMAR and X, XMA1, one's um, methylated sensitive, one is not, and you, then you can calculate the methylation um, of that, of these different um, tag profiles. Then the other one we're looking at is um, methylation restricts enzyme sequencing. This is again done on methylation sensitive and insensitive, whereby if you digest with a methylation sensitive enzyme, this methylated CPG will not be cut. If you digest with a methylation um, insensitive enzyme such as MSP1, it will be cut. So you get a difference in sequence tags. And we've been comparing these two arrays and to OMT technology. And just here, over here, you can actually see that um, the correlation between um, the array. Now, the array we've been utilizing is the Orvath Mammalian um, Methylation Array. It's got um, just under 40,000 sites on that. Um, and we've been comparing that to ONT, and the correlation there is 0.79. 
quite were correlated also to restriction in uh, RABS, restriction enzyme based um, by sulfate sequencing, and of course, then to whole genome by sulfate sequencing. Now you can see that the correlations are pretty good. He just gives you an indication, this Venn diagram of the different um, enzo, uh, number of um, CPG sites you see within each of these different um, arrays. And I'd just like to say that this was actually done on um, eight different tissues from the same animal, so that we didn't have that genetic um, any genetic uh, bias underneath that, and it was all done with the actual Rambouillet um, uh, animal that was used for the current genome assembly. And this is just to highlight these other restriction enzyme methods that we've been looking at. Um, so the ROBS, it uses an enzyme restriction site, CCGG, um, and you'll see in the blue here the number of sites across the chromosomes that you'll see. Our MRE-seq that I explained before is basically the same um, the same um, MSP site that is um, digested is the same as that plus an additional enzyme and you get a reduction in the number um, of sites and that is good if you want to then increase the number of um, animals you can multiplex therefore you're reducing your costs. Um, that is in the um, in the red here so I've just moved this and blown this up removed away the RBS so you can see it better because then you can um, reduce the complexity again with this um, dream assay because it has an ad additional um, two bases it needs to recognize. But what's pretty exciting about this is the correlation um, from the dream assay to the whole genome by sulfate is at 0.94. Um, it's at 0.58 for MRE-seq, but that's to be expected because MRE-seq is um, a presence and absence of those sequence tags, not a single nucleotide um, method. And just to give you um, an example here of why we keep doing and um, doing this um, refinement is because, you know, each one of these has pros and cons. Um, yes, you get a lot of markers if you're going to do whole genome. Um, same with um, ONT, but the cost of doing this is, is, is you know, never going to be um, for industry. It's good for underpinning technologies. The methylation array itself it has a predefined set of markers, which is great. It is still very costly unless you can have high volume um, to do that. And it has got those predetermined ones that might not be what you're looking for. RBS is still really, really good. Um, you do get a lot of um, CPG sites in that, but it is quite costly. So we've been looking at the MRE-seq and the DREAM where you um, get a reduction in the markers, but for a methylene, profile, methylene profiling tool for industry, um, the cost of this um, is a lot better, but still requires a lot of refinement. One issue with DREAM, it does require high input of DNA and we are looking at ways to refine and reduce this um, for industry uptake. I just wanted to move on to just another tool that we're looking at. Um, so we have been using that methylation um, mammalian array from uh, Steve Horvath's group and whether or not we can exploit the epigenetic clock with this. And so an epigenetic clock basically is just um, is an estimation of your biological age and comparing it to your chronological age based on your um, methylone. And we want to see whether or not if we can select animals um, that look younger or they might look older, whether that's early in life, or um, we could actually go and re-look at the methylation profile and later on in age just to see and um, incorporate that in our genomic predictions if that improves um, accuracy there. So this is work that's been done with um, in, by Alex Colton, a um, uh, scientist based here at AgriSearch, where she's actually established um, multi-species farm clock. So she's established individual ones for cattle, goat, deer, and sheep. But what we wanted to do is have a multi-species farm clock so that then if we wanted to go and look at deviation, we had a, a, from an epigenetic clock, and could this be seen as a stress phenotype? We wanted to have a baseline, and we thought that having a baseline of a combined clock would take out um, some of the caveats um, and assumptions that's made when generating um, an epigenetic clock from industry animals um, and their age and may or may not have been stressed when developing that clock. And so we've done that with the methylation array, but she's also been looking at doing that from um, reduced representational sequencing. Um, and here you can see that the correlations um, from using it from RBS sites um, has a 0.93. So that is looking promising and is a lot um, more cost effective to utilize. So at the moment, we're in the stage of actually looking if we can see that deviation 
from that epigenetic clock as a stress phenotype. We're also looking at environmentally induced methylation changes and are they inherited? And methylation can be inherited in multiple ways, whether it's cell to cell, um, intergenerational inheritance. So when the offspring is exposed to the same environmental as the parent, or is it actually transgenerationally inherited? Can those methylation patterns be inherited from previous generations? We need a stress phenotype to be able to look at this, and this is one that um, is an issue and a big problem, particularly in the North Island uh, currently, but with climate change, it's likely to go down into the South as well. Um, and this is called facial eczema. Um, it's a metabolic disease caused by toxic spores of Pythomyces charterum. It results in liver and bile duct damage. It has clinical symptoms, which include photosensitivity, and therefore you lead to this um, facial uh, this here, facial eczema, um, where it gets its name from there, but you can have both subclinical and clinical, and it does lead to decreased um, production and reproduction. It is a heritable trait, um, and currently um, it's for breeding, we use it by um, something called RAMGUARD, so we actually do a measured challenge of sporodesmin, and then we measure the liver, liver damage 21 days later and generate breeding values. So we're making use of this, um, whereby we have our um, challenge, challenge animals versus our control animals. We've taken a DNA sample um, pretty much close just after birth at tagging. We've also taken another DNA sample um, just prior to the challenge at day zero. And then we've taken another DNA sample from both the challenged animals and the control animals at day 21. We've then um, carried out um, reduced representational sequencing with this and looked for differential methylation regions. And what we have found for the control, so no challenge, um, that was only between zero and day 21, there was only six differential methylated regions and five in the gene bodies. However, for our challenged animals between zero and day 21, we found that there's just over 1300 differential methylated regions. 933 in gene bodies and 81 in promoter regions. One of the um, notable difference in methylated regions in the promoters was the CARD11, which is also associated with the topic dermatitis in humans, but also um, the hemoglobin subunit alpha. Um, we have actually found that this beta subunit has been previously associated with facial eczema um, in a GWAS study um, by Catherine McRae. Um, so um, it was interesting that we also saw methylation uh, differences here. And we're using the same experiment to then um, see whether can we see transgenerational methylation. So the animals here that were exposed to that um, toxin, that stress, were based up on the North Island. We um, shipped them down to the South Island here at Invermay, where you don't see um, facial eczema. And we have bred um, from those animals to look at the F1, F2, and the F3 generation to see if those methylation marks that were induced by the stress um, has also carried on um, and been inherited. And so just at the moment, just off the sequencer, we've actually got um, our F2 generation. So I look forward to updating that information um, in another seminar. We've also been looking at um, different uh, multi-generational families across the country, whereby sires um, have got progeny um, in different environmental um, regions. And again, everyone with a tick here, we have um, done whole genome um, bisulfate sequencing. And again, that is just being um, uh, analyzed at the moment. And our last resource that we're looking at um, in conjunction with LIC is, um, is generational families um, and their dairy herd. So we've collected um, in 2020 from three different generations. We've got 80 cows from this transgenerational study that also have longitudinal collections um, each year. And this is how we've been um, doing this, uh, that should say below. <laughs> um, yearly uh, resampling of cows retained in, in the herd. Um, so in 2020, um, we had the cows, we also had calves, and we've just basically longitudinally sampling um, these. Um, got the final set to be collected in September. And for all of these, we have the um, phenotypes um, from yearly from birth. We have the herd test, the breeding worth, production worth, and lactation worth, um, milk traits such as volume and somatic cell count. In fact, that we'll be um, looking into the methylation profile for these. So I hope that I've um, shown you that 
we base our work around making sure that we have genomic solutions that um, have underpinning work. We continue to do this underpinning work that's really, really important, but we need to harness from that underpinning work um, the important information that we can include in example in a SNP triple array or a DNA, DNA sequencing method that is um, implementable and um, cost effective and efficient um, in the industry. And if we can do that, then we can make sure we have that in, impact for um, our industry um, going forward. And I hope that we've been, I've been able to show you through those, um, particularly for the goats, but also in the meat uh, quality, just how um, impactful genomic selection um, can be from these, these tools. And I'd just like to thank that the work I've presented today is um, from our, an awesome team at Ag Research, plus all our collaborators um, and our funders that we um, have. Um, and thank you for listening.